Hey everyone, so uh, chapter two, well, I guess let me start off with, uh, this is uh, the first lecture on a programming class uh, where we're learning C Sharp. And uh, this class is a uh, Rankin Technical College uh, first and or second semester class. Um, so this is really a lecture geared towards my students um, at Rankin Technical College here in the spring of 2021. Um, the book that we are using is uh, Muroc C Sharp. It's labeled as 2015, but as I mentioned yesterday, uh, kind of the, the fundamentals of what this course go back all the way to when C Sharp was created. And so we're going to learn the fundamentals in this course. So then the year doesn't really matter as much, but we're also going to learn the new material because this, this course is definitely not just a textbook course. We, we have, uh, we have a lot of additional material, supplemental material outside of the textbook. But here is our book. Hopefully you have your book. Uh, and the reason why, the reason why we're not starting with chapter one, you might wonder why not start with chapter one, is chapter one is getting started with Visual Studio. And I just wanted to, I can demonstrate that. I don't, we don't necessarily need a chapter over it. Okay, so I'm just going to demo basically what you need to know in chapter one in this video, and then we'll get into chapter two. Okay, so how to get started with Visual Studio is just going to be a demonstration. I didn't see a need to do an entire, um, you know, a couple days on chapter one. So that's why we're skipping chapter one. We're going to start with chapter two. Let's start with the demonstration uh, over chapter one. So what we did in a prior video or earlier today is we installed Visual Studio Community. And we pinned it to the taskbar. And so I had it down here um, basically ready to go. And... The way Visual Studio works, Community Edition, is pretty similar to Visual Studio Code. Um, they work with folders, files and folders, and so our repository is here with all of our work in it. So what we're going to wind up doing is telling Visual Studio to open up a folder inside of our repository that we got from GitHub. This is what's called our local repository. Local repository. And from that point, once we have a, a folder open, for example, you might have a lab for chapter two. So it would make sense that we're gonna go into our C-sharp coursework with our name on it probably that's on your desktop, then go into the lab chapter two folder. We're gonna open that up. From there, there are some Visual Studio specific files that will be created. Okay, and those Visual Studio, because right now there's nothing there. Visual Studio, we're gonna create what's called a project and a solution. Okay, so we got to learn what these terms mean, project and solution. And that's part of just learning Visual Studio. So let's take a look here. Let's open a local folder. And I'm going to go into my desktop. And then here's my repository. Get these nice little green check marks. It says everything's synced. Chapter 2. Okay, so now that I've done this, and I've done this to show you that this file and folder view is not 
is not this is actually the the way that we're not going to be opening this up this is really common what people do so I just wanted to show you you know uh, what that looks like in Visual Studio uh, if you open a local folder you're just opening up the folder structure right instead I'm going to let's create a new project okay even though we already have our files and folders that are there for us we're gonna start this by creating a new project when you create a new project you get a lot of options here these are what are called templates um, and for example, I see here like the letter C sharp and I see VB and I see .NET Core and I see .NET Standard. Okay, so all these templates, just trying to get you familiar a little bit with Visual Studio. The language that we're going to use is C sharp. So let's filter C sharp. And the project type is council and if you do that so we're gonna be making command line as as a way to learn code we're gonna be writing council applications as a way to learn C sharp most applications that we use today are not council though most applications that we use today are desktop applications okay we're gonna make desktop applications and console applications here you see Windows Forms app that's what chapter 2 is about here I see console and I see the dotnet framework that's a command line application again we're gonna be creating both so again what I've done is I've filtered C sharp and then I filtered out console I'm just gonna click next now I've selected the dotnet framework for the console application okay dotnet core is something that's different we're just gonna be using the traditional dotnet framework okay now it's time to configure your project a project is like a single lab a project is a single lab what you do is you put multiple projects inside of a solution so you could think of a solution as a as a a storage unit or a folder for multiple projects okay so earlier I said these are just some terms that we got to kind of get familiar with you've got projects and you got solutions multiple projects can go inside of a solution okay so our location here I'm gonna change my location to be this folder that's my repository and actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it the labs folder so I'm gonna select C sharp coursework lab so you'll notice my location is as such remember solution has many projects so the solution name if I go in here if I go into my lab folder these are gonna represent our solution names so for example if I'm gonna do my chapter 2 lab my solution name here is just gonna be what it is here chapter 2 CH2 now if it's not chapter 2 if your solution name just remains something like council app 1 what it's gonna wind up doing is making a new folder here we already have a folder here so we don't need that so we just make this I know this is kind of like uh, uh, a little bit to learn here how to get this set up uh, the solution name is the folder name in this case CH2 that way it doesn't create another folder here so we're in the lab folder the solution name is CH2 and the project name we'll just call this lab 1 so we're in the CH2 solution, which is going to have all of our labs, lab 1, lab 2, lab 3, lab 4. 
And what we're doing is we're creating a console application in C Sharp. I'm just going to click on Create. Okay. It kind of spins up a little bit, writes a bunch of, creates a bunch of files and and here we are. We are looking at some code. Okay, so what I'm trying to cover is uh, the basics of Visual Studio. And so if I go inside here, now I can see some files that have been put inside of this chapter two folder. I can actually see Visual Studio created some things here. It created a solution file. I'll come back to that. It created a folder called lab one. If I go inside my folder called lab one, I see some more files here. This program.cs, this is actually where our code exists. Program.cs, it's this file right here. Like if I close this tab right here, I lost my code. I got to open up program.cs to get back to this. Inside, we're not going to be inside here much, but just to show you briefly where ultimately if you want to run this, and we can't run it right now because we haven't written any code, you can find the executable inside of this bin folder. Like you'll find an executable right here to double click and you can run it from within Windows. So this will actually create an executable file that you can run within Windows. Now, if you go onto Inside Rankin, I just want to show you quickly that there is a guide for creating your first application, and that's kind of what we're doing here. Your first program is basically doing just this, creating a console application. A console is just another word for a command line application. And when you're learning software and you're in a new language, it's so common in every new language, what you'll learn to do is say hello world. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to type in just like they have here. We got one line of code. If you can see that, we'll get into this code, console.writeline, hello world. I'm going to kind of zoom in here on the screen so you can see that a little bit better. Okay. Now to run this, I'm just going to click on debug, start without debugging. And you get to this stage right here where you've got a command prompt window that just says hello world. Okay. So I wanted to get to this phase where I could show you a command line, a command prompt window that runs some C sharp. Okay. We'll get into all of this code, what all this means. We will be hitting the code in detail in this class. Okay. But the purpose of chapter one is to show you visual studio. Now what I did, remember I said I created a solution called chapter two. If I close visual studio, and I reopen Visual Studio. Now that I've already created the project, I have it here under my recent projects. You can see my chapter two solution file. Keep in mind a solution has multiple projects. Okay, right now my one solution has one project, right? So I could just click on this and it's gonna open it back up. Okay, but obviously if it's not a recent file, if it's not a recent file, we would have to browse for it on our computer, which you browse for it over here, open a project or solution. Okay, in which case I'd go back to my desktop, I'd go back to my C-sharp coursework, I'd go back to lab, chapter two, and click on the solution file. Again, we open the solution by opening the solution, you open up one or multiple projects.
So this is lab one inside of chapter two folder. Now, to demonstrate how to add another project, so, so here, lab one is my first project. It's inside of solution two. If I wanted to add another project to this solution, here's what you do. You right-click the solution, add new project. I'm gonna do it again. Right-click the solution, add new project. Because I have a council application that I've already used, if I wanted to add another council application under the .NET framework, I could do that. But instead of doing a council app, I'm going to demonstrate a desktop app, which is a Windows form app of the .NET framework. So those are the two kinds of applications that we're going to be developing. We're going to be developing council applications or command line, and really we're, we're learning to write code when we focus on this. The, what are known as Windows Forms or WinForms? Uh, WinForms are the graphical applications that we will be creating. And those are more usable like real world applications. And so instead of creating this, I'm gonna call this, now this is the project name. My first project name was Lab1. I'm just gonna call this Lab2 and click Create. You'll notice over here on the right, it creates another dropdown. So I've got lab one and lab two, both lab one and lab two are a part of the solution for chapter two. So the, the solutions are gonna be representative of our chapters, chapter two, chapter one, so on and so forth. And then the projects are gonna be each individual lab. You might have five lab assignments, lab one, lab two, lab three, lab four, lab five, that all belong inside of chapter two. Okay, now if I go to run this GUI, you might notice it doing this. Start, run without debugging, that's how we're gonna run our applications. And it's still running the command prompt one. And you go, well, I'm trying to run the GUI. I'm not trying to run the command prompt. You might notice a couple things. Number one, this dropdown is still selected lab one. So if you just change this to lab one, it changes it uh, lab two. It changes it over here too. These are bold over here. So if I change it to lab two, lab two goes bold. And now this is the startup. It's considered the startup project. So if I now, if I start without debugging, I'm now running lab two instead of running lab one. And it's just an empty Windows form. Okay, I can go back to lab one, and now I'm running lab one, and it's the command prompt. Okay, I can close this down, go back to Visual Studio. I have it under my recent, or I can browse for it on my computer Again, mine's inside of my chapter two folder and you open up the solution file here. The solution file then opens up all of its children, which are the projects. So this is just getting familiar with Visual Studio. That's the main thing. I'm gonna do this whole process one more time and I'll just pretend that I'm doing it with chapter three. Okay, so we're, we're not starting with opening a local folder. That is a common mistake. Okay, I demonstrated that because I want to show you that's not what we're doing. We're going to create a new project to start. So let's just say we got a new chapter. You know, we're starting with chapter three. Depending on, now we've got two options here that we've used before. We're going to start with a council app or a GUI app, command line or GUI, okay? To browse to them, you can filter these things over here, C-sharp desktop or C-sharp console. Okay, we're using the .NET framework, so .NET framework needs to be in the parentheses here. Do not select .NET Core. We're using the .NET framework that's been around for 21 years. 
Okay, so once you've selected this once, you got it under your recents, that's good. I'm gonna click next. This is where you tell it where to go on your computer. So I'm gonna tell it to go to my chapter three, which is under desktop. Click my name, click on lab, click on chapter three and select that folder. So you'll notice this is the folder location, which represents my solution. Oh, I, I, sorry, I went one too deep, lab. That was my mistake. You select the lab folder here. The solution name, as I said, the solution name is just the chapter name, which in this case is CH3. Caps really shouldn't matter here, but I'll, I'll maintain it here. You don't have to worry about checking this box. .NET Framework is good. Your project name is Lab1. Let's click on Create. And I just walk through that whole process a second time. This time I'll say hello class, put my semicolon at the end. There's debug, start without debugging. You'll notice control five is your hot key. So if I hold down control F5, I should say. Control F5, uh, might have said control five, control F5. Control F5 is your hot key to run. So I created one project inside of a solution called chapter three. As I want to create another project, I'm going to add a new project. This one will be a Windows form app. It's already in the right place. So now we just gotta give this a lab two. Click on create. Now, part of what we're gonna learn to do in today's lecture is how to work with these GUIs inside of Visual Studio. All right, you might have done this before. Um, again, this class is definitely code centric. Okay, so I'm gonna be teaching you to write the code and work with the GUIs at the same time. We're gonna focus more on writing the code. Okay, but just to show you how to work with the GUIs, uh, you've got a tab over here called the toolbox. You click on that tab, the toolbox, and you go to common controls. You got a label, you can just drag and drop a label here. So we've got a label we can kind of drag around on the form. And since I said we're gonna do hello world, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, you'll notice the properties of the label are down here in the lower right hand corner. And so I'm just gonna, you know, you can kind of go to the properties window. If you don't see it, you can right click the label. It should be there by default, okay? And you can scroll to the text property and just make the text say, hello world. Now your label says, hello world. And you can go into your font and increase the font size. And uh, click on this and give it a, you, you know, you can, again, this class is not on, um, you know, There we go, okay. So now, now you got a nice little label there, Control F5 to run it. Oh, wait a minute, it's still running lab one. How do we fix that? We change this right here to lab two. That changes the startup project to run our GUI that now says hello world. This is completely independent of Visual Studio. And if you remember earlier, I said once you run it, you can go into your lab, chapter three, lab two, bin, debug, Here's a little executable. You can click on this executable and it runs it outside of Visual Studio. So I could have Visual Studio completely closed. And if I navigate to the bin folder debug, you can run these applications outside of Visual Studio. So there's your executable. That's how you work with files and folders and projects and solutions. Now I can open up chapter two or chapter three.
check out Discord here. This is just a little tutorial, so not a lot of questions yet. Let me uh, let me pause the recording and just check in with my class. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to learn to both write code and work with these forms. So there, it's going to be it's going to be forms applications or win forms. Okay, these are called win forms, and these are called council, where you just council does not have a graphical interface. Council just has a command prompt. Okay. A majority of what we'll be doing is in Windows Forms with the GUI. But to make these GUIs do much of anything, you have to learn to write code. Okay, so, you know, I covered Chapter 1 just in a demonstration here. This recording is about 26 minutes long. So I covered Chapter 1 in a 26-minute demonstration. That's really all you need to know about getting into Visual Studio. Now couple a couple things here uh, worth noting um, there's a lot more to Visual Studio than I've covered um, for example I could go to YouTube uh, do a Visual Studio community tutorial for beginners well this tutorial for beginners is probably a whole lot like what I just went through okay but it gets much more detailed uh, and this is this is all stuff that we just have done um, but you know like any any tool there's Visual Studio community uh, tips for beginners and so you can kind of go through here um, productivity tips and so this is from Microsoft I like these ones with lots of views okay because you know they're pretty pretty decent um, and I guess my point being is that I'm just showing you the bare bones basic basics um, we will be doing more with Visual Studio as time goes on and there's definitely more that Visual Studio can do and there's a lot of people that spend time on you know showing you how to write code in an efficient um, with the with the tools showing you the tools to write code in an efficient manner but again we'll, we'll use those with time we'll get into them today the basics so we've all done if you watch that video, you could write this Hello World program. So check that off the list. Chapter two, okay, chapter two textbook goes over not the council applications. Chapter two goes over the fundamentals of the GUIs, okay? So the way that this is all kind of shaking out here is I have time to cover chapter two in a lecture today and and I don't, I'm, my second semester students will tell you, I use these slides as a guide to make sure that I talk about the different pieces. I'm not one of these instructors that just reads every bullet off of every slide. You know, these are just my guiding light, if you will. This is my my lighthouse. I know I need to kind of start here and, and end here. You know, this is my lighthouse to where I, you know, I need to go or need to avoid, if you will. Um, but but uh, I'm going to cover this today. Again, these are Windows Forms. And it's really not even about coding Windows Forms. It's about designing Windows Forms. Um and so uh, this this chapter really just is not um, a high focus on writing code it's more uh, still just kind of getting used to Visual Studio and these different windows which I think is a, a decent place to start like I don't want to overwhelm you with code you know 
and Visual Studio at the same time. I would rather just, let's hit Visual Studio today. And then on Monday, uh, I'm going to have to do another lecture uh, where we get into a little bit more code. But this is a little bit more about Visual Studio and writing these Windows forms. Um, and so just kind of looking here, you know, the new project dialog box, uh, I definitely showed that, right? So to get a new project, you right click the solution, add new project. There's always 15 ways of doing the same thing in Visual Studio. You could alternatively do file new project right here. And then decide, I'm gonna create a Windows form. I'll call this Lab 3. Now, I noticed here, this is not what I wanted to do. This was creating a solution named Lab 3. Okay, so the option of create new solution is not what I wanna do. I wanna to add to solution. Right, so that's a different option when you do file new project over there. I gotta make sure to add new solution or add to solution instead of creating a new one. I don't need to create a new one here. I'm still in lab three. Ah, there we go. That adds it to the current solution. It didn't create a new one, so that's good. So lab three. Um, so that's what this kind of shows you in a, a, a dated, if you will, way of doing the same thing. Um, the options dialog box for setting the project options. And so what you find out is that there's settings for everything. And so if you right click on, on your project and go to properties, um, you see options here for lab three. Now, this options dialog box is not a project, it says project options, but that doesn't match because this is application build, build events. You'll notice that's not what's over here. So that's not this window they're showing you. Instead, I'm gonna go to options, of my solution, let's go to properties here. And so this is solution properties still doesn't match. So instead there are options inside of Visual Studio. These are just general Visual Studio options. Actually now that I see this window, this description threw me off. Um, so let's find our Visual Studio options because I did options on my uh, project, not it. Uh, options on my solution, also not it. So let's go to Tools, Options here. Ah, this is going to be it. See this? Environment, Project, and Solutions. This is it. So these are options under Visual Studio, Projects and Solutions. And under locations, you can change the default location. This is awesome because I wanna do that. My default project locations are not gonna be inside of C users admin. My default project locations, if I change this, I can go to my desktop right here. I'm gonna select this folder. Okay, I'm not going to change my templates location at all. And that's that's kind of the point of showing you that. Now, if I were to do, f uh, if I were to kind of start over here, yes, I want to, I'm going to close this and save my solution. Okay, let's, let's start over. And let's create a new project. And either one. Now notice my location is at least closer. It's at least closer. It's in the right directory. I can just click on this ellipsis now and click on the lab folder. Sometimes you'll submit homework in your lab. You might submit, you might submit 
homework in your homework. You might submit work under hands-on test. Okay, so I don't wanna select anything deeper than my default directory right here. Okay, because that allows me to select, okay, what kind of work am I doing? Am I doing a lab, a homework, or a hands-on test? In which case you select that folder. So you can kind of see by changing that location what that does for us. It's kind of a, gets us closer to where we're gonna be writing our code as a default. So that's cool. Okay, went ahead and showed you the new project. Okay, so let me just do a demonstration, right? So, so if I'm gonna make my Windows form look like this, we've got some labels, we've got some text box, and we've got some buttons. So let me go ahead and demonstrate this. Um, open this up. Chapter two. And again, we'll, this will be so routine after a couple of weeks, you won't even have to think about it because Microsoft made Visual Studio and they made these tools um, for you to be able to at least make the, the GUI, to make the graphics, you know, pretty quick, okay? It, they, they label it rapid application development so that you can literally drag labels over here pretty quickly change what they say like for example if I'm gonna build this I guess I can alt, I can alt tab it's gonna say subtotal right so you just say the text it says sub total you could copy this control C control V right get another label now this says discount percent discount amount I'm gonna kind of slow down here just a minute um, and explain some things that I realize I kind of skipped in total okay then we got some text boxes over here so over here on the left in my toolbox is a text box And I'm going to say properties. Now I'm going to give this text box a name. All of these, all of these controls have names. It's currently called text box one for its name. But there's a convention. I'm going to call this txt subtotal. Okay. The txt is a prefix that's saying this is a text box. So txt subtotal says this is my subtotal text box. Okay. Drag another one on here. This one I'm gonna call TXT discount percent. You'll also notice the capitalization here. It starts with a lowercase abbreviation and then every new word is capitalized. Okay, we'll call it, we'll, we'll give that a name here in a little bit. That's called, uh, well, it's called camel casing. We'll call this TXT discount amount because it's a text box for the amount and txt total I think that by doing a quick demonstration I can show you a lot more than just reading off those slides txt total now on here you'll notice that these are grayed out which means we can kind of go in here and find the read only property and set it to true. And if you make a text box read only, that means a user can't type in it. That means you could only use code. We're gonna use code to put values into here. Okay, so we can use code to enter information or uh, put values into these text box. The user can type into this one but then we're going to use code to populate those. Okay, then we got a couple buttons. A calculate button. 
Okay, we're going to call this, or the text will say calculate, and we're going to give it a name, BTN, because that's the type of control, button calculate. Okay, I just wanted to show you how to make it. Okay, how to make, using the toolbox and the properties, we can make an invoice form in a matter of minutes. Okay, now coding it is a whole nother beast. In fact, I just kind of did something that made that happen. Uh, I'm going to undo that, control Z. Okay, because I don't want to do that. Um, I, but I realized, you know, as, as I was writing this, that I totally skipped, in, you know, something that um, maybe you realize, maybe you don't. Um, you know, I would say when I was eight you know 18 or whatever learning learning a coding language um every everything on your computer someone had to write code to build other than the physical hardware itself Okay, so you're probably on your laptop or you're on a desktop and there's a hard drive in there and there's a processor in there and there's RAM in there, you know. But without code, your computer is just a big heavyweight, a uh, big heavy paperweight. Your computer does nothing without someone writing code to build an application. In fact, your operating system itself someone had to write code to build windows i mean that's what bill gates and steve jobs did uh i don't know when in the 80s 70s whenever they built this you know bill gates is one of the richest men in the world because he wrote the code the early code to build Windows, the Windows operating system. You know, Steve Jobs is one of the, uh, was, uh, when he was alive, uh, you know, richest men because he wrote, you know, the uh, graphical interface for Apple. You know, uh, Bill Gates wrote the graphical interface and the command prompt interface uh, for Windows. And so they were the creators of these operating systems, along with a lot of other people, of course. Um, then once you have an operating, I guess I got locked out of Cash App. Once you have an operating system, then then you make individual applications on top of them. So just looking at, you know, my computer here, someone wrote code to build PowerPoint. Someone wrote code to build OBS. Someone wrote code to write Discord. Okay, someone wrote code for Chrome. Someone wrote code uh, for Exchange email uh, client. So everything has code behind it. Without code, um, your computer is a heavy paperweight. It does nothing. It's no good. Same thing with your cell phone. Everything on it. Someone wrote code. Okay, to, to get the thing to run and do anything. So... What we're learning in this class is a language to write code to build apps that solve problems. You know, this little, this little uh, form right here with subtotal, discount percent, total, and all this. You know, I'll give you a real-world scenario. I had a student in the early years. He worked at a tuxedo rental shop. Okay, and so men... Um, uh, I don't know, maybe women, whatever, would come in if they needed a tux um, and, and get sized up. And what they would do is they'd take all these measurements, okay, by hand, and they would paper calculate, you know, the total for the tuxedo rental. They would say, okay, well, you need it for this number of days. You need these five pieces for the tux. Uh, this is, you know, this math, you know, this times this, this number of days, you know, it's going to cost you 500 bucks. Okay. I had a student said, uh, you know what? I'm going to take that from a math system by paper and I'm going to make something as simple as this. I'm going to make a form. I'm going to make a computer application 
that does the math for you. Well, what's the benefit there? You eliminate human error. If you code this properly, if you build this application properly, you no longer have the human element of mistake of either, you know, someone doesn't know how to multiply or they make a simple mistake, they, they, they can't read their own handwriting, whatever it is, um, you know, these applications solve problems, okay? I, I went into yesterday how application software is changing the world and, and I couldn't believe it. This was, this was incredible, an incredible story. I got to share it. I was talking with a Rankin instructor yesterday, and he was an electrical instructor. Um, he was a new guy, and so I was just meeting him yesterday. And he goes, um, you know, man, you wouldn't believe what happened to me uh, over winter break. And I said, what? And he said, I looked down at my new Apple Watch. Okay, I looked down at my new Apple Watch, and it told me that I had heart failure, heart irregularities. I had a heart problem, and to call the emergency room immediately. And he goes, I didn't believe it. And he goes, I felt fine. So... I called 911, went on an ambulance to get checked out, and three hours later, I was having a bypass surgery. My Apple Watch saved my life because I was in the beginning stages of a heart attack that could have killed me because I think the stats are 50% 50, 50 of people having a heart attack survive. If you, if you get to the point you have a heart attack, it's like a coin flip if, if you survive, if you're lucky enough. So his Apple Watch, this software on his watch, told him because it was reading his pulse and oxygen and blah, 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 he was having heart problems, told him to call an ambulance. He did. It saved his life. So software is changing the world. This little calculator that we're making probably isn't going to change the world, but, but it's the beginning. you got to learn to you know, walk before you run. So, okay. I just thought that was an incredible story. I had to share it, and it literally just happened yesterday after class. So that was some cool stuff. So, you know, yeah. Uh, three ways to add controls to a form. So, you know, you can double click. Okay, that adds a control to a form. You can drag and drop. That adds a control to a form. Or you can click the button and then drag over here and it'll drag the control, you know, kind of position and size it. Okay, so those are the three ways to add controls to a form. Um, you can work with multiple controls at once. For example, highlight them here, and then you can kind of drag them all around um, to work with multiple ones. This this one that's kind of this uh, white uh, boxes as like you can have different um, uh, like an order that you select them, and then you change this one, and they all change. Um, now that white, it means something. I got to remember what that white indicator means. Those are, that's white and those are black. Um, it's kind of like the primary selected control. Um, it says you can size all the controls in a group by sizing the primary control. So that, that white means it's the primary control. Now, it, it goes on and talks about the name property. I, I kind of showed you the name property. I have this text box, and this text box has a name. Um, the rule of thumb, it, there's a couple things here. The rule of thumb is that anytime you add a control, 
that will be used in the code. We haven't touched any code yet. Okay, for example, if I double click this button, here's the code. It opens up this other file, form1.cs, right? This is where we'll actually write some C sharp code. So if you are going to work with the control in the code, for example, I knew I was going to be clicking that button. So now we've got this button calculate click thing here. Okay? I knew that was going to be here. So I wanted to name my button something that was meaningful. Right? I knew I was going to have this in the code. So because I'm referencing this in the code, I wanted to give it a meaningful name. But these labels, these labels are just for the for the end user to look at. So I didn't really name these labels. You'll notice their names are label one, label two, label three. It doesn't really, they're not meaningful names because it doesn't really need to be because I'm not gonna work with these labels in the code. Now some labels you do work with in the code, some you don't. These are just for the end user to see. Um, if you wanna play it safe, you give them all a name. The rule of thumb is if, if you're working with a control in the code, then you want to give it a name. Okay? You'll also notice that my name follows what's called the naming convention. Okay? The naming convention of my controls is a lowercase three letters that, that determine the type of the control. BTN representing it's a button. TXT representing it's a text box. Okay? Then after that, every new word is capitalized along with its description for what it is. This is the total text box. This is the discount amount text box. So that's a, that's a naming convention where we start with the type of control first, and then the name. All of this together is called camel casing, which means you start with a lowercase, and then every new word is capitalized. So it's called camel casing. So we, we kind of talked about the name property and its importance. Okay, The text property I covered as well. The text property is simply what the user sees. So here's the text property of a label okay, that says total. This text property says discount amount of this label. Here's the text property of my button that says calculate. So the text property is what the user sees. Okay, other properties of the form are the accept button, the cancel button, and the start position. The accept button means if the user hits enter, it's going to click that button. In other words, if I go to here and I make another button, I believe this is, uh, I think there's another button on here that says exit. Okay, so I'm just going to add this called exit is the text and the name is btn exit okay now when i run this control f5 oops let's change it to lab 2 control f5 okay which one of these if i hit the enter if i hit the enter key that's the accept button neither of them right now so there is no accept button so if I click on the form and I go to the properties of the form and I find the accept button, I can either select the calculate button or the exit button. Again, I clicked on the form. You can even go to the properties here. If you click on this little drop down here, these are all the controls that are on your on your um, in your on, on the form itself, including the form. Right, so this is a button control, button exit, form one, label one, label two, text boxes. If you select the form itself, it has a property for the accept button and I'm just gonna say the calculate button is my accept button. So if I save that, control S for save, control F5 to run, you'll now see that that's actually highlighted and if I hit the enter key, it would do whatever that calculate button does. Now that calculate button doesn't do anything. I haven't coded that. 
Okay, I got a form that looks like it does something, but I haven't coded anything, so uh, it doesn't do anything. But now that that's the accept button, if I were to hit enter as the end user, it would run this code for the calculate button. In fact, I'm gonna add label one dot text equals Hello world. This is my hello world. I have a label called label one. That label one has a text property. And whenever I click this button, it's gonna change that label's text to say hello world. So if I run this, now of course if I hit enter, you can see label one now says hello world. Okay, or click the button and says hello world. All right, we've been going for 56 minutes. Okay, this is a good place to pause the lecture and let you guys uh, take a breather. So I'm going to pause the recording. Um, we kind of left off here. We set some properties on the form back to the name property it says sets the name you identify the control in your c sharp code so the name here uh for this button if you remember the button we called this the btn calculate button and then when we double clicked it this is our code where we see btn calculate click uh, this label one is here um, and so we called it label one in our code. Now what I, what I did was, you know, I ended up calling this label one, which is really not a good name. You don't want to leave things just called label one, label two, label three. The reason being, uh, that's not a descriptive name. Okay. So this is actually a bad practice. What I did, you know, leaving this the default name and referencing it in my code. This is kind of, you know, but no, no. So in order to fix this. You know, one thing that you could do if you right click, uh, rename, um, we could rename this to uh, label output. So I just type in there and I click up, apply and it says renaming this will update 10 references in two files. And so the point being is that um, the name of that label is stored in 10 different places on two different files and so there's a certain way to rename it okay so i called it label output now if i go back here this subtotal you know it's called lbl output now so there's a proper way of renaming something if you do like i did and kind of made that mistake um, you can rename that in the code right click rename they actually call that refactoring but that's whatever it's renaming They talk about using the three letter prefixes that I've done here. Um, it doesn't need to be changed for controls that you won't refer to when you write code, like a lot of labels. Okay, we talked about the text property again, the accept button, oh, I came back to this. Um, other properties for controls, uh, I kind of covered the read only property already. Uh, en enabled, you know, if I if I set enabled on this exit button, since that exit button doesn't really do anything, set enabled to false, and then I run it, it is completely gray. You can't click on it. So that, you know, disables the button, if you will. With setting the enabled property of the button uh, to false, button exit. And then I can come back in here and set the enabled to true just by double clicking and then you can click it again. Uh, so that's enabled read only um, tab index. Um, you have a tab order, which means, you know, as you press tab, the cursor goes from control to control. So that sets the order in which the um, controls receive uh, the easiest way to, to set that, if you go to view, 
Uh, should be a tab. Let me find it in here. There's a, a tab indexing here, but uh, I don't feel like I don't think they moved it on me, or I don't think I forgot where it's at. I, I thought it was under view. Let's. Do you guys see tab index? Mm, let me see if they moved it. Oh, there it is. I just had to click on the form. I wasn't clicked on the right thing. If you click on the form, you'll notice that the, like if I'm clicked on the exit button, you get the the boxes, the white boxes around the exit button. If I click on the form, I get the white boxes around the form. Okay, so when you're clicked on the form, it also focuses this on the properties down here. If I click on calculate, these are the properties of the button. If I click on the form, these are the properties of the form. So you click on the form, then you go to tab order. Okay, and this, you can kind of see it's going, by default, this is the order that you added the controls to the form. So right now, labels do not receive focus. So it'll go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, back to four. Okay, so that's the default tab order. If I run this application, you can see it starts on that text box, and that's the tab order. Okay, labels do not receive focus by default. Okay, you can change that, but um, to change that tab order, again, you focus the form, and then you change the tab order here. Maybe I wanted it to go here, 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 here. And then when you run it, you can see now your tab order is completely screwed up. Okay, but the point is you have control over your tab order um, tab stop says whether whether it should stop there like labels don't have tab stops because you're not supposed to stop there it doesn't by default and then alignment is like right aligned um, left aligned so on and so forth okay just checking a couple conversations here. I already adjusted the tab order. Access keys. Access keys are hot keys, okay? And what you do is you hit um, ampersand in the text property. So let's let me let me just demonstrate this. So like uh, if I wanted the C to be the hot key then in the text I would put an ampersand in front of that's that and symbol in front of calculate and notice how it now underlines the letter C let me do it on exit I'll make the X I'll put an ampersand in front of the X and it underlines the letter X so it's a visual indicator now you can hit alt and then the hot key so I'll hit alt C and notice it runs hello world it ran my calculate button by hitting alt C okay so that's your hotkey and that's how you set up hotkeys in Windows forms you guys okay I see the dot dot dots can you hear me okay everyone everyone good I'll follow suit <laughs> Those are your hot keys. We already talked about the enter and the escape keys. Let me pause. Okay. We've uh, 
we've solved uh, the little bug that I was having here. Um, problem solved. So continuing on, here we are, we're on slide 18. You know, if you kind of look at some of the things that we've done, we've set the text property, the accept button, the cancel button. Um, start position. Let's take a look at start position on the form. So we click on the form. And if we look at start position, and we got to find it over here in the properties. Um, it's a behavior. It's not behavior. Here's start position. You can change where on the screen this starts. Like, okay, center screen. So now when we run it, there you go. It starts in the middle of your screen. That's all start position is, is where does the app, probably center screen is really the only thing, I mean, that makes sense. Um, you have options there, so you can kind of uh, mess with those. So it's start position on the form. Um, we set some hotkeys with the ampersand sign. Um, it's good practice for all of your forms. You notice how they say form one here. Well, let's change the text property of the form to get that to say something more descriptive than form one. So the text is what the user sees. This is a, let's see what they say in their picture. In their picture, it says invoice total. So again, if I go back to the form properties and I say invoice total, now that's what the user sees. So the user sees the text property. The name of the form, I like to name it here. Let's rename. So form1.cs. This file right here, we're going to rename this to form FRM invoice total. And it's going to say you're going to rename it all throughout the project. And you say yes. And now when you look at the properties of this form, the name is form invoice total. Okay, so you could have done that by naming it here, but I just renamed it here. Again, you can do it multiple ways in Visual Studio. So it's good to give your form a name, a descriptive name that follows a convention and a text value for the end user to see what's going on when they run the form. Okay, so that's talked about those three kinds of controls. Where do we leave off? Renaming the form. Um, we renamed a file, so I went ahead and did that. Rename a project or solution. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. If you change the name of a project, you may also want to change the name of the assembly that's created for the project and name of the namespace project from the application tab of the pro project properties window. Okay, so let's talk about that. Changing the name of the project. Why would you want to do this? Okay. So my project is named Lab2, but maybe I want to rename it to something else. Maybe this, I, I didn't name it correctly. Maybe it's supposed to be Lab02. I don't know, I'm just making this up. Hit enter. Okay, so in here, it's still Lab2 on the folder structure. Um, so renaming it Renaming it in Visual Studio does not necessarily rename it in Windows. So that's one problem um, that we could fix. 
but let's let's go down the path of their suggestion here. If you change the name of the project, like we did, we changed this to Lab02. You may also want to change the name of the assembly that's created for the project and the name of the namespace that contains the, the project from the application tab of the project properties window. So let's go project properties. So I right click the project, go to properties. Here's the application tab that they're talking about. So we're also gonna call this the assembly name lab02, lab02. That's what they're talking about right there. That's gonna help really what that does. And then we could actually rename the namespace here, lab02. And that starts creating that bug, so let's not do that. Let's rename this here, lab02. This is not something you do frequently. There you go. So you'd have to change it there, and then probably you're gonna have to change it within Windows as well. So renaming a project or a solution, none of that, none of that is mandatory, like it still would've worked. But um, for consistency's sake, you know, you would have a lot of different places to rename if you wanted to rename your project. And once this is all said and done, um, you just want to save everything, right? Keep in mind multiple projects inside of a solution. Just click on Save All, File, and now you can close it. Just save all. And then you can open up. Open up. I like to open up the solutions. You can open up an individual project, but I like to open up the solutions. You see here this, because we rename things, this happens. Um, it says lab02 unloaded. Um, this happens when you rename projects. And so you can remove it. This is actually kind of good to show. You can remove it. It didn't delete anything. It's still on our computer. We can add an existing project now. Let's go inside of our lab, chapter two, lab 02. Let's add this project to the solution. So it's still there. It's still working. Just sometimes renaming can, can cause that hassle. So that's that's something that's worth being familiar with, how to how to um, re-add it to Visual Studio. Okay, that takes us to the, basically to the end of this uh, PowerPoint. Um, you know, a fair amount of new information. All of this is in Chapter Two. Let me go ahead and stop recording.